You're listening to the Straits of Video Podcast with Rob Lane. What's up and welcome along to another episode of my podcast, Straight to Video. How's everyone doing? Hope you're all okay as summer begins to officially roll in and hopefully some live music shows on the horizon. I've got a really cool guest on today's show and I was super happy that he agreed to come on and chat. Today's guest is guitarist Thomas McRocklin. To some of you, that might be a name you've not heard in a while and to others, you'll be more than familiar with all the cool stuff he's been doing recently as this guy is really building something special with his new music, online presence and all around super cool community. Thomas has been on quite the unique journey in comparison to a lot of guest musicians on this show. Picking up the guitar at just four years old, his amazing abilities soon led to a great deal of attention, including landing an opening spot for Ozzy Osbourne at eight years old. Yes, for real. This would lead to a stream of TV and magazine appearances, even appearing on the Little and Large show back in the 80s. Thanks to his dad's fearless ability to hustle, a chance meeting with Steve Vai at the 1988 Donington Monsters of Rock would strike up a friendship between the two guitarists and Thomas would be thrown into the California rock and roll world with a starring role in Vai's promo video for The Audience Is Listening, a record deal with Interscope Records, the formation of the band Bad For Good, a debut album and then US tours with Joe Satriani. It was all a bit of a whirlwind for this young kid from Newcastle, UK, and you simply couldn't escape Thomas and Bad For Good in Metal Edge magazine and all the guitar mags back in the day. But what happened after that? Well, Thomas is gracious enough to share all this in our chat along with an insight into his new world of returning to the guitar after almost two decades away. And this new exciting world is created with his great new synthwave band McRocklin and Hutch, his online guitar school and community school of McRock, and so much more in this fun chat. Before we dive in, please show support for our friends Dead School Coffee who are really starting to make waves in the world of independent coffee with their great rock and roll ground or full bean roasts, which you can grab a huge 15% off if you order online at deadschoolcoffee.co.uk using the promo code STV on checkout. We really appreciate them being an ongoing part of this show. So let's dive into my chat with Thomas McRocklin. After our talk, please be sure to set some time aside and dive into his new and exciting guitar world over at mcrocklin.com. Or if you're a guitarist yourself, check out schoolofmcrock.com. I also highly recommend you check out Thomas on both Instagram and YouTube because he shares some really great videos and stories over there too. This really was a blast, so I hope you enjoy my straight-to-video chat with Thomas McRocklin. You can hear the guitar. Sounds great. Sounds great. Cool. Best backdrop ever you've got there as well. <laughs> Superb. I don't know what the real life one is. No, this is all real life. Yeah, we, we have um, about 95 scenes in this uh, this entire virtual world that we have called Shred Club. So, yeah, but it's fun. All your online presence is amazing. Is that all your oh. work, all your branding and everything? I have somebody that helps with video editing, but it's not for the stuff that you generally see. It's a lot of the stuff that's coming soon. So yes, I guess everything that you see right now on Instagram and YouTube, that's uh, that's my work. The, the virtual stuff, the graphics and the backgrounds and all the sort of scenes, 
um, that's a 3D artist that works with me and um, yeah. I think we both just egg each other on and spur each other on because he'll come up with a little idea and I'll be like, what would it be like if we could do this? Just grows into a monster. <laughs> and it, it just gets a bit silly, yeah. You know, when you're live streaming, you're kind of doing stuff like that. It's a lot more entertaining, you know? So if I'm going to like drop into a track, well, why not do that on a virtual stage? And actually the stage setup was actually for the band stuff initially, but I was like, hey, we're not doing band streams every week now. I might as well use the stage setup for something, you know, kind of a bit more fun. Just love all like the little glitches and stuff that's going off in the background. It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. A lot of screens, but we have different angles. So that's kind of the, the thing. So everything is like multicam. So if we're playing guitars, it's all like interactive. So we can do what we kind of like with these angles. So if I'm playing. <laughs> to you know full cams yeah it's fun <laughs> thank you ever so much for doing this I, I really appreciate it oh my pleasure thanks for having me man oh no problem no problem it seems you've almost come like full circle in the way of like geographically from your american adventures as a young teenager which we'll get onto but you grew up in Newcastle, had a few crazy years making a massive buzz in the US, but now you're back in Newcastle. Are you near to where you grew up originally? I actually am. So I'm, I'm from the Northeast and basically, yeah, my time was, I, I, I'm born in Newcastle, grew up kind of in Newcastle until suddenly I start venturing away and, and spending six months in LA and then a couple months back and then, you know, touring from Canada to New York with, you know, Joe Satriani and doing all these things. And it ultimately then led meant that I was spending more time in the US than I was over here, which totally screwed up my, my accent for a while. I mean, it still is, uh, you know, until I'm shouting loudly on stream and, you know, kind of getting hyped, you don't really hear too much of the Geordie accent, but it does come out. It does come out. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, basically, um, it was either the US or Newcastle. So when I kind of left the guitar scene in the music world, I was still living in Newcastle, but just doing other things in music. How was it spending like six months in LA then coming back to Newcastle? Was that a bit of a reality check? Well, yeah, back then the contrast was much greater because as soon as you got, you know, into London was bad enough, but then you got that train or flight to Newcastle and suddenly everything seemed, seemed like grim, you know, grey. There was just no colour. It was just like, ah... And me and my dad, who we used to travel together a lot, <laughs> we, we would both have like the same kind of feelings as soon as we got to the, the central station or the Newcastle airport. Was like, oh. This post-tour blues and there's like six months in LA oh. blues. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? But at the same time, you know, I mean, certain parts of LA, especially Hollywood back then, was pretty bleh, not very pleasant neither. That surprises people a lot, doesn't it? You have this glamorised oh, yeah. view of, I think you think of like what you see of Beverly Hills on the telly is what Hollywood's going to be like. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's rough, you know. And the last time I was in LA, uh, probably like two years or so ago now, um, it's it's been cleaned up a lot. But somehow I found myself at a party in Hollywood at 3am, which was a complete surreal night. And I was waiting for an Uber and it was, it was frightening. It was just like, oh shit, just where's this vehicle just get me back to anaheim where there's nothing happening you know it's just like oh hollywood at 3am yeah still still not a pleasant place do you remember the first time you were kind of drawn towards music or perhaps specifically the guitar itself because your dad played a little bit of guitar right there was always a, a guitar around yeah. you, you were like four years old so i don't know what you recall you know because he was into bands like thin lizzy led zeppelin black sabbath and ozzy and stuff so the type of music that was in the house and played in the car, had guitars like up front. It was like a prominent part of the, the sort of songs and stuff that we listened to. Although he wasn't like a virtuoso shred player or anything like that, he was like really into music. So into music enough to have a, a guitar around. And just that was enough, you know, like back then when I'm like four or five years old, there was like, there was no distractions of what you would get today. You know, there was no tablets, internet, computers and stuff. So it's like, hey, you know, there's a guitar there. That would be something that I would go and play on. And, you know, when I when I learned that first chord progression, I think that's all it took to, like, get that spark where it's like, whoa, that sounds like the boys are back in town. It sounds like that thing. And it was like, ah. Somebody said it's almost like you're learning magic chords. You're not supposed to learn those chords, what those guys are playing on the record. But all of a sudden, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's there. It's like... <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, yeah. So that that was kind of the moment, and um, and I've always had like a really really obsessive personality. 
So if I'm into something, it's like completely OTT, which is, um, you know, it's a little bit dangerous at times, you know, and it's dragged me in different directions. I got hooked on gaming once and became a professional gamer. And then it's like, oh, what, what am I doing? Like, I can't play 12 hours, you know. <laughs> Was those 12 hours going faster with even faster than practicing guitar? Oh, oh, mate, you've no idea. Yeah, it was it was terrible. But yeah, and then then I got into like coffee and you know, not drinking coffee so much, but like the the kind of art, if that sort of makes sense. I got really into latte art and making different coffees and had like a commercial machine at home and all these things. And that got a bit out of hand because like we have a lot of family that lives very nearby. There's like seven or eight houses within probably 200 yards. So suddenly my house was like a coffee shop. It was just like, and then I realized, you know, I'm spending like 30, 40 pound a week on coffee beans. And this was before, you know, I was like into Instagram, so there was no brand deals. There's no coffee bean deals to be done then. It was just like, cash, buy beans. <laughs> Do you still like coffee or did you not burn out on it? Well, I got rid of the machine. Uh, I mean, first of all, it, it was just sucking up so much. I mean, it's a, it was like an E61 uh, dual head commercial machine. You know, you can pull like 800 shots a day and continuously steam as much milk for as many cappuccinos as you want. Um, so not really the type of machine that, you know, you could just leave on casually in the background at home, even though I did. So I got rid of that, but kept the grinder and then I got an aero press and that was like a nice balance. But nowadays I literally have a coffee every four or five days and mostly have tea. And, um, yeah, I'm very, I'm, I get really kind of like, even back when I was into coffee, if I had more than like a couple of day, I'd get like really just skitsy and just jittery and yeah, very like up and down. Massive sugar rushes from sugar, big crashes, and the same from coffee, you know? So now I'm like really conscious about just trying to not get too hyped because I know 10 minutes later, I'll be like, oh, <laughs> cry my eyes out, like, you know, hyped. And then the big crash, you know, it's like, it's, it's happened all throughout my life. How were you originally learning to pick things up on the guitar? Was it through chord books or like the old tuition videos, which you used to get? Mm, a hot licks, mostly. Hot licks, D um, I was going to say DVDs, no. but this is way before <laughs> DVDs. No, no. Hot licks, VHS. So yeah, watching, um, you know, guys jumping around on stage in spandex and just trying to imitate the playing and sometimes a little bit of the spandex as well. What was the other one? Was it Wolf Marshall? Was he one of them? Oh, yeah, there, there was a bunch of them. Um, Hot Licks was the ones that I had and it was like RHS or something like that. I remember I had like Arlen Roth cassettes. Um, I don't know, I had a bunch of them. You used to be able to like mail away for the cassettes in the back of magazines. Oh, yeah. I mean, I remember the mags. I remember, you know, like just drooling over guitars, uh, you know, in the back of the magazines. I actually did that once with the Pink Gibson. You know, back then there was some of these guitars that were in the magazines you couldn't really get so easily. I was like putting so much pressure on my dad to get this pink Gibson. And then he ordered it mail order and like six months came and then it arrived and that wasn't really like my thing. I was like more into the super shred, you know, like Ibanez type of guitars by then. And I was like, oh, I was so gutted. And then we sold it on and it was this like, um, it was a custom and there was not too many of these guitars made. And then for some reason, well, by chance, like five or six years later at a totally random auction, we saw it. It's like, wait a minute, is that the same one? Is the same serial number? It's the same guitar. And I think my dad ended up swapping a van for this guitar to get it back or something because like totally unplanned. And then, yeah, I have it somewhere over there on the rack. So I still don't play it a lot, but like it's got a certain sound. Are you quite sentimental with things like that? Perhaps more nowadays than you was? I certainly, yeah, I, I kind of appreciate, you know, you know, the guitars like back in my Ibanez days when I was kind of staying with Steve Vai and Steve Vai was a bigger part of my life and, um, you know, I had a really great relationship with Ibanez. And I, even though I don't play Ibanez as like my primary brand and guitar now, I've switched to headless guitars with Kiesel, Back then I would get like a brand new guitar and you know, Steve Vai would, we'd end up towing it on the back of a Harley Davidson down Hollywood Boulevard to kind of relic it, to give it away to hard rock. Wow. And I wouldn't think twice about that. What time of day did you do that? <laughs> was that 3 a.m.? No, it was broad daylight. It was like, no problem. So we do stuff like that and all my guitars are like absolutely just hammered, you know, they've seen so much. They've got some personality and character. A lot of character, yeah, exactly. That's, yeah, that's the kind way of putting it. But, mm, although I like the history and, and, and that, you know, the look of a lot of those historic guitars that I have in my collection, I wouldn't kind of just get a brand new Kiesel and start like throwing it around the streets and putting some character in on it, you know, it's just, 
but I'm not overly precious. I know like the guitars that I use on stream, you know, when I'm changing guitars, you know, three, four times sometimes, you know, the guitar racks are getting clanged and, you know, it's just like absolute chaos. So yeah, I mean, they've got to be played, but I think I am a little bit more sentimental for sure than I was back then. And I think a lot of people maybe is, maybe think I didn't appreciate the guitars, but you know, it's not that. It's just like they were obviously for a lot of people very hard to obtain these guitars. And, you know, once I got that relationship with Ibanez, it became a bit more of a, a normal thing. You know, hey, we're broken neck. Hey, Ibanez, LA custom shops right there. Steve would call them up, you know, we'd get the guitars fixed up. And it was just a little bit more of the sort of normal thing, you know, and I think Steve, I kind of almost encouraged that kind of behavior. I used to get a kick out of it. And to him, it was like, oh, my boys, you know, what are they like? They're just wild, <laughs> aren't they? You know, yeah, 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 yeah good one. Meanwhile, I'm like, <laughs> so I, but I always appreciated the, the you know, uh, my instruments. And um, even though sometimes it may not have looked like it. <laughs> <laughs> Did it become more like consuming? Because you say you said you've got quite an addictive personality. Was you like immediately drawn to the virtuoso players like Steve Vai and Joe Satriani? I was. Was there anybody else at that time who you were fascinated by? Players that I took influence from, it really just changed from year to year. So starting off like in the early days, you know, for sure, Vai, Satriani, uh, Randy Rhodes, you know, loved Randy's playing. And other guys, you know, of that sort of era as well, uh, you know, maybe like Paul Gilbert and, and stuff like that. But then a couple of years later, I was into like Django Reinhardt, Danny Gatton, Chet Atkins, Julian Bream, classical players, and not really listening too much of the big shred stuff. So it really would change. Did you always like challenging yourself? Did you like the challenge to listen to those different styles? I just like the quirkiness, you know? Yeah, I mean, when I, when I heard like Danny Gatton and the sort of phrasing and the, the sort of the touch and the, the humour and stuff like that, I've never been one to kind of sit down and learn covers and songs. So when I heard uh, or would listen to Danny Gann, I guess there was inspiration for sure coming into my playing in some way. But I would never sit down and go, oh, that's amazing lick. Let me learn that note for note, you know. I think it was more just maybe as it was that personality thing, just jumping from kind of because it wasn't too long after that where I wasn't listening to guitar at all. When I was doing the bad for good stuff, the only stuff I was listening to, maybe with uh, Danny Cooksey, the singer, was, you know, House of Pain, Cypress Hill, Funk Dubious, all of that kind of era of that kind of uh, rap genre. And then that moved to sort of different rap genres and, and stuff like that. I think rap had a big influence on my playing, especially later on after it had a time to take that break and to come back. It was kind of thinking about my playing almost in a little bit more like a lyrical sort of way. Certainly with the phrasing. Was you influenced in any way from like the metal and rap crossovers? No, but I did go to see like Body Count and stuff like that live and it was it was like a really fun show. Body Count uh, with Ice-T was just become like a big thing in LA when we were doing Bad For Good. And I really enjoyed that kind of metal rap in like sort of few thing but it fizzled out so quick you know and grunge just came along and took all that stuff out the way like the bad for good songs you know it was like nah steve i songwriting you've got nothing on nirvana or pearl jam it's finished i don't think there's ever been like a musical wave to literally wipe out so much stuff like that one did killed it all and what was really interesting about bad for good is actually there was kind of another side of bad for good that not a lot of people saw unless you saw bad for good uh seen so seen so <laughs> unless you saw us alive because the band itself bad for good we didn't really like this time the stuff that was on the record so much so the stuff that the label had done with vi and then we'd learn and you know although I, I got some songs on the record and got quite a few little parts in there the majority of the the record was wrote by steve vi and the stuff that the band organically had started to write was much more current with what was happening on the streets of la at that time you're at that perfect age to be exuding that kind of stuff. 100%, you know, but when we were on tour, we really had to have X amount of bad for good tracks in the set list or the record label would be like kicking off, you know? So we do our best to like kind of put our spin on them. But I think with that whole setup, you know, if we were just given that time, just to do our own thing for a year. Because you, when you saw the, the live shows, it's a much heavier, faster pace compared to the record. Even though there's not much footage from that, there's like probably three or four bad cams on YouTube or something like that. But the sort of vibe that we gave live was a much heavier experience, a lot more organic and raw compared to the record. Do you think you could have gone more in like the direction of like what Silverchair were doing? Because they were like a young band from Australia. Quite possibly, but you never know. You, you never know. know. It's like... 
hindsight. <laughs> you know, you never know. And plus, you know, before the biggest gig that we ever did, at that point, I walked out and went back to Newcastle whilst the biggest gig that we were about to do was sold out. It's like a record, uh, well, break-in venue for a lot of bands, you know. I'm sure like Eddie had played there. It was the sort of venue that had kind of sparked a lot of big moments in a lot of bands' careers. And it's like, I didn't really know too much about this actually until about two years ago when I was back in LA and I was uh, hanging out with a, a guy called Sam, an amazing guy. And back then in the in the 90s, Sam Alvarado was along with Mark Chimino were a big part of Steve Eyes in a circle and was working with me and uh, helping us out band for good and we were like really really great friends so until I went back to LA like a couple of years ago it was like what this venue you know what it was sold out you know everybody was like looking for me but I was already on the flight back home I didn't really see I because I just expressed my my sort of feelings to the record label they didn't really relay much else back to me about everything else and the schedule was all just crazy so it was like it was kind of interesting finding out like these things after I go in and it's like a little bit like oh what could have happened you know you just never know man we've all got those moments I mean I'm sure that's bigger than a lot of ours but everybody's got them along the way oh 100% and I'm, I'm very much the type of guy that no matter what happens no regrets you know I wouldn't kind of change anything because you know with what comes with that side of things hey you know um, the addictive personality you know that could have turned into drugs and wh- whatever else mm-hmm. you know if that obsessive personality of mine during that time in LA and I was coming up to that age, if that had happened, I wouldn't have lasted long at all. You know, I would have been a, a surefire goner. I would have been one of those guys, 3 a.m. on Hollywood Boulevard trying to sell you a little something <laughs> to get a set of guitar strings because all the brands want nothing to do with me. <laughs> hey, man! <laughs> set of nines! <laughs> Come on! <laughs> A lot of places mention your first break was supporting Ozzy in your hometown at eight years old. But then everything, it just moves on to the next thing. You don't just walk up and land a support slot with Ozzy. Do you know much about what the background was behind you landing that slot? Honestly, all of these situations, 99%, it's just down to my dad hustling. You know, he comes from a a bit of a gypsy background. Well, his, his sort of mother side probably is anyway. He's from Scotland, Motherwell. And, but I think there's that, there's that sort of underlying hustle there. And he, you know, when he saw something in my playing, he wouldn't think twice about calling ITV, BBC and say, hey, I've got, you know, my son, he's playing the guitar, he's doing gigs, you know, and the crowds are going crazy. You need to get a film crew over here. These days, I think people, you know, would be more tempted in that situation just to post a little clip online and stuff, you know, not calling, you know. But it was that kind of what's the worst that can happen approach that sparked really it all off you know I remember when I was like seven or eight years old and the first time a film crew came to my house previous to that day I was just you know posters on the wall playing my BC Rich and playing along to Aussie tracks and then suddenly it's like back to back it's like ITV's in the house BBC's in the house now it's BBC want to take you down London and then it's just like it just started to roll like like so fast and it all just like that's how it kind of and then I think quickly you know my dad realized that hey there's probably only so much in the UK that we can do right now hey let's let's go over to the US and different situations start to emerge from there but with specifically the Aussie gig I imagine he would have rang you know the management dug out who's the management who is it got them on the phone and a lot of the time I looked so ridiculous that it kind of caught people's attention it's how Steve I probably caught my well it was really I was literally sat in the back of my dad's car you know head to toe in leather gear with studs all over me this crazy hat on cowboy boots like five sizes too big and I'm sitting there with an Ibanez gem which is probably there's hardly any of them in the UK and Steve Vai's guitar tech walks past and he's like this is at Donington right this is in Donington can you play that thing takes me into the Steve Vai you know the, the tour bus and you know the rest is history so it's just situations like that he just had an uncanny knack for just being at the right place at the right time like I don't even know how we got to the backstage part of Donington Monsters of Rock no idea we probably went down there with no tickets it's probably one of those situations where they say like oh how did you get backstage well I just walked through in with a purpose and people are like oh he must be part of the yeah 100% crew or something like that yeah so there was just a lot of that he was just really good at doing stuff like that what a legend yeah you know and it's funny like I don't know many people that would do that you know um obviously like you recognize talents and stuff but like i think it just um a lot of those situations you know for him he's actually behind all this 
he's actually a, not a, a very people person, you know, he didn't really like socializing too much, which really led to some unusual situations because I was a terrible talker when I was a kid. I was very shy, very quiet, and it was all about the playing. It was about the noise with the guitar. But <laughs> when we'd be on live TV together, suddenly the presenter's asking me a question and I'm like, <laughs> and it's on live TV, the most awkward moments and it happened time and time again. And you see him like doing this and he's like, okay, I'll stop talking. And you can see yeah. like, it was just all so uncomfortable. You know, he had to go through it. If he was going to get on that phone, he's going to be on live TV uh, a whole bunch of times. <laughs> but, yeah, so some of the worst interviews ever. So it's probably no wonder <laughs> why a lot of the shows are, are like just, um, especially like he had that Scottish accent. I had that really Geordie accent. Well, the guys in the US, they just, they just didn't understand a word that we were saying between the no, pair of us. They didn't you know? stand so, a chance, did they? <laughs> not a chance. So I was like, oh, just shut up, would you? Shut up, guys, and play some guitar. Yeah. Do you remember what you actually played at the Aussie gig? Was you just on stage on yourself shredding? Yeah, 20 minutes, 15 minutes. I have no idea. I, I... Zach Wilde with his jaw on the floor. Yeah, Zach, oh, Zach. I mean, such a legend. I mean, although I haven't spent much time with Zach in, over the years, every time I've been around him, he's always just been one of the nicest guys. You know, really, really cool. Just salt of the earth. Like, there's a handful of guys in the, in the industry or close friends that I know that are just like absolutely just one in a million type of guys and, and Zach's always been that one and I don't know how much I mean Ozzy probably did have a lot to do with me opening up because it wasn't a done deal it wasn't like I went there to open up for Ozzy I went there and I just started playing through Zach's amp with my guitar and Ozzy and Zach you know just happened to be there and then I'll start playing and then you know the laughter and you know like oh what, what's going on here that all began and you could just feel that buzz you know even like the sound man and stuff were like whoa so it was just like in that moment hey why not play a little spot before we go on tonight and I'm sure probably some of that was down to, to Zach Wilde as well just being so cool about it you know because over the years I don't know if you've seen many of the YouTube videos but sometimes there's guitarists big in the industry that, that are like, nah, I'm not going to play with him. I'm not, I'm not going to play on, on the venue if he's playing. I've had that happen a few times. So it's like unusual. The Aussie gig, that's when all local press led and it led to national TV and all that kind of thing. That must just snowballed after that. I think so, yeah. Because after that, the Disney Club, more trips to London to do BBC stuff, uh, like the morning TVs. And your dad's driving you all these hundreds of miles. Yeah, or <laughs> more commonly, I think back then, because we would be taking at some point two three guitars and then suitcases and you know sometimes <laughs> one thing we'd always try and do is like I was still a kid doing all this so he'd always try and go out of his way to make sure like the hotel had a pool and we'd have like a massive but massive inflatable dolphin or something ridiculous you know so suitcases getting bigger but uh, there's guitars the suitcases full of gear and even when things moved to to visit in the US more frequently wherever possible it'd be like hotels near Disneyland in Anaheim or Six Flags and Magic Mountain stuff so it was always like that fun get that balance you know it wasn't just work 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 and you know that led to some really really cool times as well when you met steve at donnington obviously you've been learning his parts and stuff do you ever get starstruck in those situations or you'd always been confident in your playing and you might have been quiet normally but you could just flick that switch when it came to the playing side of it i think so i've always had this thing where nothing that's in front of me should affect my playing you know whether it's live tv or being in front of somebody I don't know if it's just because I started doing that at such a young age that and, th and that was like my comfort area playing and the talking was like, uh, you know, especially on TV and interviews. But, you know, I remember when Bad For Good started to do more um, press kits and interviews and doing stuff with MTV and stuff like that. Again, you know, even into my early teens, horrendous, like top tier, like, oh, <laughs> what is cool, like awful interviews. They like give lessons for that kind of stuff, don't they? For like actors and stuff for when they do press. Like, oh, you've got to have lessons. And if you're a shy person as well. Yeah. And I think a lot of people, they saw the playing and they had expectations of the personality. And although my personality was absolutely just completely wild as well, and it got wilder as I sort of settled into the bad for good and all that stuff, still the one-to-one the -one TV and uh, all those kind of situations where it was a little bit more kind of just reserved and it's like, all right, we're, we're sitting down talking. That was 
those were the moments that were like the real like oof, oof. but yeah media training yeah is a thing i guess so but i've, I've found after such a big break, in actual fact, just doing more videos and content and the more you, you know, as you'll know yourself, the more you're in front of the camera, the, the more you can just be yourself and not be phased by it. But I remember a couple of, well, probably about three or so years ago when I first dabbled a little bit on YouTube by myself, the first camera I'm putting on the stand and it's like, oh, where am I looking? And then I'm, yeah, it was awful. My early YouTube stuff and I'm, I'm not really a big YouTuber. It's only very recently that I've started to like do more purpose content for YouTube and I've really enjoyed it. It's actually just been a different pace because previously I've been really like going hard on Instagram and the reason I loved really making quick videos for Instagram is it was like a great way of, especially after the break, it was a great way of like documenting my plane. Hey, I'm working on this lick, put the camera on, do a silly lick. You know, we've got a wicked five to 10 little Instagram video that could maybe get a couple hundred thousand views or something. And I would be doing these type of videos like four or five days a week because I was practicing a lot and the camera's just right there. But now I'm like, oh, it would be nice to just have a little bit more, you know, almost telling some of the stories, history of my guitars. So now I'm like, actually the last couple of months, I'm like, okay, let's start doing a little, a little bit of actual YouTube stuff. I still don't think it's gonna be the, the best talking, uh, you know, but uh, <laughs> the stories might be all right though, <laughs> hopefully. From your meeting with Steve, it led to you um, being in his video, The Audience Is Listening, which is still an amazing video. It's just got so much fun and personality. And that led to you getting signed to Interscope. You were signed as an individual. That's right. Do you recall what their immediate plans was? Was it always to form a band around you? Or did they maybe think, oh, let's do an instrumental album like Steve's Passion and Warfare, do you think? My dad's, you know, feelings that it was always best to have a band with similar aged members around me. And I liked the idea of doing a band thing, you know, back then certainly instrumental music was like, you know, unless you had a vocalist, there was just not that big of an audience for that type of market, unless you were one of the, the main marquee players of that era. So it was always, you know, whichever way we decided to go in with whatever record label and management and even those Peter Grant instances that we had uh, sort of uh, meetings with, he was very much, yes, let's form a band. And likewise, when I decided we would actually go to the US and do all that stuff, it was going to be a band situation. So yeah, I signed a six or seven deal record deal with Indoscope early 90s. I remember that coming through on the fax. I was I was out my yellow BMX and this fax came through. What was it, a rally banner? <laughs> uh, oh, uh, I have no idea what the brand was, but I was into my BMXs then. Yeah, I remember like seeing the millions of dollars, you know, X amount of million sign here. Of course, you'll never see it. Like, you'll see nothing of that money ever. It'll all be accounted for somewhere else. Oh, so yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm sure when I left Interscope, the actual official figure was I left them about 200000 or so dollars in debt. But, you know, that's Interscope's fault for giving me like five to $10,000 a week per diem money, which I spent on ridiculous clothes and outfits and silly stuff. Holy shit. Yeah. Those days are long gone in record label terms. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, no wonder the... Uh, <laughs> No wonder, like when I left, there was so much debt probably accumulated. But uh, yeah, obviously they, they didn't pursue it or anything like that. You know, have me horror myself on Hollywood Boulevard selling strings at 3 a.m. to pay them back. <laughs> that would have been a bad look for Jimmy, uh, Jimmy Iovine and Ted Fields. Yeah. But yeah, so band, band situation was the deal. And the band just piece by piece came together. You know, my dad just by chance saw Brooks Wackerman seeing me play uh, at a NAMM show. I think that's cool though because I think a lot of people think that maybe Bad For Good was assembled by some like record company executive board but like you say it was your dad who found a couple of the members. Yeah, yeah. Hustling. Yeah, he basically discovered Brooks Wackerman, Zach Young and Danny was the only guy that was found <laughs> by the, the label. And I remember, you know, being like when it came through the, the choice was between two actor singers it was danny cooksey and somebody else and we heard that danny was like doing some movie stuff and terminator and stuff like that but we still hadn't seen this and um the facts of the two like people came through danny cooksey and whoever the other singer was came through we were like, okay let's let's go with danny that's you know he looks like a cool dude but of course the faxes were black and white my dad didn't know he had ginger hair not that it really makes any difference <laughs> afterwards he's like oh he's got ginger hair man i'm like so it's like, he didn't turn up with his terminator mullet though did he 
But was it a million miles away? It wasn't a million, you know, he had that look for a little while and maybe, maybe it was milk in it. Oh, but maybe. Danny's really cool. <laughs> in hindsight, it was absolutely hilarious to him. And it turns out this other kid, of course, had blonde hair. And that probably played on my dad's mind for probably four years or something, you know. What would have bad for good been if we got that singer with a blonde hair, you know? We would have ended grunge. Grunge would have never happened. Oh, man. <laughs> I love it. Amazing. As a young boy, what was your reaction to the USA for the first time? I mean, I used to spend my summer vacations over there with my dad. Obviously, you were doing like lots of cool stuff, music industry stuff, meeting all these cool people. But I used to love things like you could get to see films before they hit the UK. I'd come back from my summer vacation. Yeah. And I'm like, I saw that film weeks ago. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> Yeah, good shout, good shout. For me, uh, you know, it just seemed like bigger in every sense of, th of the word, you know. Just more happening in the music industry. There was always events to go to, especially compared to Newcastle, where you might do a gig at, you know, a social club or a pub that you shouldn't be in. And I'd have to, like, jump out from the Marshall stack, get kicked out, and then, you know, that would be the end of it. So apart from, like, the bigger gigs, like the Aussie gigs, and they were few and far between, you know, gigs of that sort of scale in Newcastle was like, you know, not that many really. In contrast, yeah, LA was just like everything was happening. And I think until I hit my teenage years where I started to have some freedom in Newcastle and we lived down uh, Whitley Bay at this time, that's when I started to get some Friedman, Friedman? Friedman amps. I'm always, uh, always looking for some Friedman amps. That's when I got some freedom. And that's when the, the feelings about going back to the US, that's where I was like, it suddenly turned and it's like the fun was hanging out with my friends, doing normal kid stuff, which, you know, as fun as my dad had tried to make it by, you know, getting hotels or pools, going to as many theme parks as we could and just making it fun. You know, once you get that sort of freedom to, to hang out with your, your mates by yourself and do things, you know, with them, even if it was just playing, you know, laser quest and going on and hang out and stuff. Suddenly to leave that, to go back to LA to possibly tour for another three months, you don't have that same kind of independence and stuff. I think that's when the, the, the sort of cogs start to turn a little bit. And then it wasn't too long after that, it was maybe one or two trips after that where I was like, you yeah, know, I don't want to do this. And rightly or wrongly, my dad's always been the type of guy is like that said to himself and said to everybody else, the moment he says he doesn't want to do it, I'm going to be right there and we're just going to do whatever he wants. So uh, I imagine like, I remember that day where the record label, uh, one of the main AR guys came over and he's like, took me for a private walk along the boulevard, just me and him. And he's like, you sure you want to do this? And for me, I wasn't really thinking about what I was walking out on. It was more about, I just want to get back to Newcastle to hang out with my friends and do you know my thing. I didn't really see the, the sort of uh, magnitude of the whole thing. I didn't really appreciate the whole thing, you know, because it all just became normal, you know, doing big gigs, touring with Joe Satriani, all of that became normal. It was like, all right, get off the bus. Do you do some stuff with Damn Yankees as well? Possibly at a, like a, a, a sort of one-off show. There was some really, like, some really cool isolated shows in LA, you know, where out of nowhere, there would just be, like, mad lineups. You know, I remember one gig that we did, opening up for Cypress Hill slash House of Pain, the whole Soul, Soul Assassins guys, and the Ramones in one night, and there was a bunch of other guys, and Bad For Good were, like, the sort of opening act for those guys. This was when I was really starting to get into to rap music, and I was so gutted because, like, we, we did our show, and it was a great show. It went down really, really well. Those guys, the guys that were into the sort of rap stuff, really, really liked the harder edge that we were putting on the Bad For Good tracks for the live shows. But I was, I was so gutted because like Cybersill came on and somebody from the crowd threw a pint over the turntables and Cybersill literally just turned over every turntable on the stage and walked straight off. In the opening song, you know, it was just oh, starting to kick off. And I was like, I was absolutely... <laughs> Got it. Bear in mind, Interscope, they owned Death Row Records. So when I would visit Interscope, I didn't really, you know, if I saw, you know, a mega guitarist, that didn't give me the same buzz. But if I saw somebody that was on Death Row Records or, you know, a legendary rapper down the hallway, that, that would be like, that would blow my mind. That would give me the buzz, you know, of probably somebody else meeting Steve Vai, Joe Satriani and all these other greats. You know, that was like the day-to-day -day stuff. But me seeing like a rapper that I was like, ah. Oh. That's the stuff that I would like. I'm sure I saw Dre in the Innis Group offices once and Snoop actually. And I was like, hey, The Chronic. I mean, The Chronic actually turned out to be 
my favorite, I'd say top three of albums of all time. Such a good album. What was the reaction from the rest of the members of the band when you said you'd had enough? There was no words said. There was no um, explanation, really. Uh, so they were probably confused, I guess. Yeah, so... And when I went back to the UK, there was there was no dialogue. There was nothing. It was just like cold, sh like cut. So no doubt, maybe the record label explained some things back to the guys. But I think in hindsight, you know, the whole thing probably could have been handled much better. I don't know. It's just one of those things that happened. It is what it is. Have you guys connected since? Because Brooks has gone on to be in Avenged Sevenfold and things like that. You know, that's the cool thing. You know, we've all went off into different directions after that. And a couple of years back, maybe three or four years ago, once I started to show my face in the music industry again, Brooks Wackman came to Newcastle with Avenged Sevenfold and we hung out for the day. It was great. It was really good. It was like old times straight away. Just really good hangs. He came, you know, to Newcastle. I took him around town. It was the coldest day in Newcastle ever. So we we're both like just freezing our asses off. But it was great. Um, we hung out um, and we went to hang out at the backstage and stuff for the show before and afterwards. And yeah, it was really good. Uh, my wife came along and she got on really well with everybody as well. So it was, it was great. When we went over to LA a couple of years back, uh, we went to uh, Zach Young's wedding and I uh, got to hang out. So um, the only guy I haven't met, well, I didn't meet until the last time I went to uh, Nam show was Danny. So we had a little bit of a longer break there. But Danny seems like he's doing really well now. We speak to each other occasionally online. So we all are in contact. There's definitely no hard feelings. Everybody gets on really well and is kind of all doing successful things now. So that's kind of like the silver lining in the, in the whole thing. But yeah, so many requests to do a bad for good reunion. It's it's unbelievable how many times <laughs> I get asked for that. That'd be pretty exciting, man. To see how it what happened. Who knows? I know. I mean, it would be. Um, and a couple about about a year and a half, two years ago, there was so many people who were like trying to seriously like get it to happen, even as a one off show, you know, in LA. But uh, you never know. I mean, especially as things coming out of COVID and I'm playing and doing things again. So you, you never know. You never know. Never say never. <laughs> So you say the guitar began to take something of a back seat and slowly phased mm -hmm. out as you listen to rap and hip hop, but eventually getting more into a lot of producing and mastering, which I think yeah. had become an interest to you when you was recording with Bad For Good. And did you just become uber focused on all that and just let that take over? I was really enjoyed the studio sessions, seeing Steve Vai, you know, work the gear and the mixing and, and that side of things when other people would just leave and he was sitting there mixing i would kind of sit and just watch and you know ask him questions a lot even simple things like how does the bus work you know on a mixing desk you know he explained that and effects routings and stuff and steve had a lot of gear he had like this light without heat company which was like a gear rental sort of company and there was just a lot of gear around all the time so i was really interested in that side of things and we had some really really cool sessions with um you know guys like jimmy Iveen, who's now with uh i think he's on the board of apple and he was like one of the big co-owners of Interscope, but actually a legendary producer and some of the studio sessions i was around like i just found like just seeing them take a track from okay to like what you've done is like it's like transformed the track you know so i remember like coming back to the uk and just get my first akai sampler korg workstation task m a track and just starting off like with some simple stuff and then i got really hooked on drum and bass and then i actually had this alias and start going absolutely nuts on the drum and bass side of things for a while and had a couple of tracks played on friday night radio shows and stuff like that as a totally different name that was the beginning of like all right, I like making music, but I would like to do it for other people a little bit more. And then I started getting into production and then the gear obsession, you know, <laughs> began like just accumulating and buying huge amounts of equipment. Did you have people come into you or did you get like waking in a studio with other musicians? Yeah, that's a good question. Um... I did actually do a little bit in other studios, but it was mostly people had heard what I was doing and wanted something, whether it was production or mixed or in later years. It was really the mastering that I kind of really went all in on because as I quickly discovered, you know, some years later, 
it got to the point where I was taking on mixed projects and people were sending, you know, a hundred and odd tracks of audio for a two and a half minute pop song. It's like, why do we need this ooh on track 83 and this hey on track, you know? So it just became this massive time suck, you know, production. And I got more interested in just doing, right, let's take these stereo files that somebody's done the production on and I'll, I'll get into the final mastering. And, and then that became something that I did for like six, seven years every day a lot a lot of albums uh, mastered and, and all of that experience has been like really good to like take you know the, the production elements and the mastering stuff and kind of start to actually utilize it in our own McLaughlin and Hutch stuff and stuff that I do which is not that frequently by myself uh, the solo stuff it's mostly the, the McLaughlin and Hutch stuff so yeah it's good to kind of put that stuff back in Is it right? Was it almost 20 years pretty much left the guitar? Yeah What was the spark that reignited the guitar for you do you think? It was people putting guitars in my hands that knew about my past and I basically I started working in a music store just trying to keep my head down really I wasn't you know ever talking about my past you know it was like to me it was just it was just it was something that I just never brought up but like so often people would like they'd want to know about you know what happened and you know about the stories and they knew how you know much I was playing in my earlier years, and they'd like they put guitars my way. I would like you know pick like just play a few notes and then put it away, and that was it, you know. But it started happening a little bit more frequently, and I was like, mm, all right, let's just try something. And I think it was my old Steve Ray Vaughan Strat. I I, I stopped picking that up at home. And I always liked that guitar. It had a really, really nice sound and um, the Texas Special pickups, the sound was really cool plugged in. And it was just like a simple little two minutes video that I posted on Facebook at this time, like the end of 2016. And it was like the reaction was like quite unexpected. It was suddenly like a lot of people talking about, oh, you're coming back, like it's this thing. I'm, I'm, for me, I was just like, isn't that what people do? They just post little clips of themselves playing guitars, but it turned into this bigger thing. It didn't take much for like that obsessive personality to just go like straight in on, on the guitar. Were you seeing it with fresh eyes or fresh ears? Well, a little bit of both actually, because I remember it wasn't long after that where I looked at all my guitars, like at this point, they hadn't been touched in a number of years, like, you know, thick end of 20 years, you know? So all the gems, you know, like the trims were missing, the pickups were like the switches weren't working, they're all just in dreadful shape. So initially I'd emailed Steve. I was like, Steve, um, I'm starting to play a little bit again. Um, I want to get my guitar sorted out. And he put me back in contact with Ibanez and Ibanez were like instantly, oh, we can sort that, we can fix this. And, you know, it was like just the support was just right there, like straight away. And even Ibanez UK had heard on heard what was going on with Ibanez US. And they were like, OK, let's let's get you some current guitars to play with. That was like really, really cool. And then suddenly I'm like, I've got new guitars and, and stuff like this. But on the fresh ears, fresh sort of perspective, on one of these trips, early trips, like in back in maybe early 2017, I, I went to LA. I visited Bogner with a friend. He wanted to buy a Bogner amp. Um, so we, we visited Reinald Bogner at, at his factory. And I remember trying an amp and trying one of the guitars through it. And instantly one of the guys goes, hey man, it sounds like Steve Vai. And that moment just, it just hit me like a ton of bricks. And I remember on the spot, it was like a hard code decision. Change the plane. Everything's got to change. After we finished that trip, I went back to the UK and Ibanez were really, really cool. They sorted all the spare parts and done some of the guitars up and reworked them. And But when it was time to get back to the UK, there was that moment where it's like, right, everything's going to change in my play now. I want different dynamics. I want different picking things. I want a different style. I want to finger things different. You know, there's always going to be a little bit of Steve Vine influence and other players influence, but it's not anywhere near as prominent because when I start playing again after such a big break, it's like I continue where I'd left off in my teenage years, which was probably a little bit more Vi-ish sounding in those in that era. And I was like, as cool and amazing as Steve is, and I've got a great relationship with Steve now, I just wanted to have something that was fresh and unique and something that's like a little bit more identifiable as like, oh, that's McRocklin sound. And that's where, you know, many, many hours of playing and just looking at everything the way I was playing, what I was focusing on, how I could develop certain techniques and stuff, you know, that 
2017 to 2018 was like it was like early days in terms of pumping you know seven eight hours of playing every Man. day getting the mechanics back the sync the dexterity the strength and just kind of getting everything that was like the grinding year i always knew it would take that amount of work to get to that point again because you know when you when you go down to playing like 10 minutes in three months during my years away from the guitar you know going back to when people would give me guitars to try and they would still want to watch me play you know maybe i could pull a couple of licks off for sure but to me it felt it felt awful it's like oh these don't feel like my fingers it feels like i'm playing with boxing gloves on it was like it was awful it wasn't your voice anymore which it had been no it was like i can do this but it, it just it just felt terrible so to get that to go away to get the mechanics and everything to just be like absolutely like on point it took that 2017 to 2018 year to really and then still some after that actually you know you never still stop practicing but i'm you know right now i'm like maintaining and sometimes pushing ahead but there's so much other stuff going on it's difficult to like right i'm gonna have two months just practicing nothing else you know it's really really difficult to do that now i'd love to just speak a little bit about your mcrocklin and hutch stuff when did the whole synthwave movement get on your radar because you got the opportunity to record with gunship on their song video game champion was that one of the first dives into it yeah i love the gunship stuff thought it was just a really really cool band but yeah that that was probably not long before I did that track where I really kind of got into Synthwave and I think what's really cool about Synthwave is it's like it has that nostalgic sort of vibe that really hits home with you know guys with myself that we kind of lived through the 80s in one way or another it's such a fun genre to play over as well and it's quite versatile I've known Tim Hutch from McLaughlin Hutch for a number of years and you know actually um, I used to master a lot of his projects and he was I mean absolutely prolific his output for track releases over the years was just like insane you know like crazy volume of releases and I used to master a lot of those releases for him so we were always in contact but we both kind of got into like synthwave at the same sort of time and I'm sure it was one of the the latter sort of mastering sessions where I heard some of the tracks he was sending over to get mastered and I was like ah that's that's like retro wave synth wave you know why don't we start doing stuff together three months later we had riding out done you know it was like there we go so uh yeah calyx i did some stuff with calyx another synth great synth wave artist and in less than a week i'm really excited for this one one of my favorite artists that i listened to uh over the last year or so pilot he's such a cool guy and he's got a track coming out in about a few days about four or five days that has the most obscene shred that i did on this track and any electronic track that i've ever heard it's completely it's completely over the top um but the track is absolutely amazing i don't know how i'm gonna learn these solos it was just like i don't know maybe i had that night where i broke the rules and i just had all the coffee all the sugar and recorded these solos <laughs> what was the reaction to mcrocklin and hutch when you opened for dragon force was the crowd behind you it generally was once they heard the power chords kick in <laughs> the first song of the night was always like all right tim you just go up there and start the set and it's like two minutes of electronic stuff until i went and kind of started you know and then every night i'd make the tracks a little bit heavier with more power chords and then as soon as they heard the power chords and the shred then it kind of all right we, we kind of get this now there's this sort of common ground this is why they brought them on tour yeah exactly <laughs> But Herman's such a like a legend, you know, and Herman really liked the album Riding Out. And it was really like a good opportunity to, to do that too. It was just a lot of fun. But I found the further south we went, I mean, when we played in London, it was instantly the crowd were just mental. They were just so up for synthwave. It was crazy. And then there was the occasional part of the country where they probably hadn't heard too much synthwave. And it took them like a song or two to like loosen up. But yeah, so it kind of depended where we were in the country. But the further south we went, the more sense that it instantly made. And um, yeah, those power chords. How was it for you getting back on stage? It was fun. Yeah. At this point, I'd already start doing like a lot of Instagram stuff, a lot more Instagram lives, start doing some stuff uh, at the NAMM show. So that sort of familiar feeling and knowing what to expect, even though I hadn't toured, certainly by myself, you know as a small unit my brother actually came along and really really helped us out a lot on that tour but 
I think just doing stuff in front of the camera, in front of an audience, whether it's online or on stage, it, it's kind of, it gives you that kind of, it just helps to, you know, to not get that stage fright and, you know, contain yourself and just have fun and enjoy, enjoy the moment. Unless you're playing in your hometown. And I remember that first song, you know, oh, sharp bends. Herman reminded me after the show, he's like, <laughs> that first bend, sharp. I'm like, oh, don't remind me, mate. Don't remind me. It was the only show that I had that extra adrenaline. Uh, just knowing that there was so many friends like and family that just never see me play in so long and I'm like going oh, oh, do, 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 this, the sharp notes <laughs> echoing everywhere and uh, but I it's like I once I heard that sharp note I'm like okay you just gotta level down just no no it was, it was fine it was Calm fine down a bit. yeah <laughs> <laughs> but yeah thanks thanks Herman for reminding me yeah <laughs> rub it in <laughs> How is it for you now, after all this time away from the guitar, stepping back into an entirely different playing field for music, which you're obviously adapting to great with all the online stuff, but do you find you've got this like split audience now of people finding you for the first time and then people are like, holy shit, Thomas McRocklin, that's smoking young guitarist. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I think it's starting to not be so much that because as I'm doing more stuff online and YouTube and streams, there's a lot more people that just know me for what i'm doing now which that's awesome yeah no that's that's really cool and that's ultimately probably you know the, the best way to be and then when they find out about the history later then it's like that oh you know and that still happens a lot but this i think it was the first year or two on instagram instagram was like the first platform that i you know really went hard on for like two years and it was like the first one or two thousand followers mostly knew me from the past right but in the grand scheme of things that they are like few and far between so it was really my job to then just ramp it up and go after like every audience and just go absolutely you know go after the big numbers to get the big number of followers on Instagram so then it becomes a little bit of a different not vibe but it's, it's certainly a little bit of a different dynamic you know because it's like I'm not afraid to have like a quite a hefty conversation with somebody that DMs me for the first time with a question you know a lot of people are surprised by that like uh, initially like you know you reply to DMs and stuff but you know consider the, the number that come in it's fun moments like on Instagram like somebody will message me and say yeah, I saw you play uh, in Sacramento I'm like, oh shit, what, you were there? Like, you know, tell me about it, you know? And then we're just going for it, texting back and forwards. And I love those moments, you know, it's like really fun because it's it's like, for me, I get that insight of like what it was actually like, you know, because it was such a long time ago, right? And a lot of people can recall it a lot better than I can in some ways. So a lot of those times like important in a lot of people's lives. So they've got it there, it's ingrained. Yeah, no, and, and, and I like that. But yeah, it, it is very much a mixed bag though, for sure. It's quite exciting, really. Yeah, it, it is. And um, I mean, right now it's really, really like I would love to pull, get back to doing more unique things on Instagram, like making five to 10 second crazy videos. I really, really like those type of videos. And I think with YouTube shorts becoming a main a, a thing, once I can get back to like producing like three to four really cool new fresh videos for Instagram a week and they feed into YouTube shorts and I'm doing the long form content for YouTube. But the next thing is like, I'm trying to get my guy that's helping out with all the virtual stuff. Hopefully in a month or so, he's gonna come full time do the video editing, do the School of McGrock editing, because that's another big, you know, every week there's a brand new lesson on School of McGrock and that takes the concept of the lesson, the shooting of the lesson, the editing of the lesson. That's like 48 hours of the week just wow. gone on School of McGrock. And then for, for the rest of the time, by time I prepare for like a stream with Fishman or my own streams. Dude. And then you've got your family. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's like a yeah, lot. It's up to you, man. I know, it, it's crazy. So we're working on, but there's some really cool things. And also this dream stream project which has been like a huge thing for the last six months so once we get these projects launched and the video edit has really taken some of the load off then i can start to push ahead with some really sort of fresh and some fun exciting things as well because I, I like i just like shooting i think when i make those instagram videos it's like often like you get ideas for songs even though the video it's like such a short like you know my type of video anyways like five to ten seconds but a lot of the time some of my favorite tracks have been because the audience have had such a strong reaction time and time if i repost a certain video and it gets like hundreds of thousands of views 
I actually really like that riff. I'm going to use that riff in a song now. You know, people really dig it. And it's like, it's kind of an interesting way of writing songs, you know? So, so I definitely want to get back to that as well. I've like been off Instagram, you know, I post stuff on Instagram, but it's not the type of stuff that it's going to continually grow your account. It's just like reminding people going live on Twitch, doing this, we you know, it's like, it's not the big hitting posts that I used to post last year, you know. It's great though. I, I love it. All this creative buzz. I think it's fantastic. Well, I've took up far too much of your time, but uh, I've loved chatting with you, Thomas. It's been great. No, it's been fun. Appreciate you sharing all the old stories and I'm excited to see what happens next. All right, what should I do, man? Cheers, mate. Cheers. Bye. Thank you so much to Thomas McRocklin for sharing such an incredible journey on today's podcast. It really was super cool for me to share some time with someone who had such a unique experience in a style of music I hold dear in my heart and to see how cool and exciting everything he's doing right now is a real bonus. You can find out more over at mcrocklin.com, schoolofmcrock.com and all over Instagram and YouTube. There's so much great content on all of these channels. So whilst you're catching up on early episodes of this show at stvpod.com, be sure to check out those channels too episode 100 is just on the horizon so thanks so much for continuing to listen i've already got the next half a dozen chats all lined up and there's some great ones on the way so please continue to tell your friends all about the show and where you can please like follow share and review to build this tiny little show into the monster i'd love it to be thanks for listening guys enjoy your day and speak to you all real soon Mm -hmm.